Greetings and salutations. Thanks for hanging out with me for a while. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do one of those long, leisurely hangout videos where we talk about something. And the something this time around is distro hopping. We're going to talk about moving from one distribution of Linux to another. And I'm going to show you some of my tricks that I use to make that an easy thing to do. Before we get into all of that, little feedback, little setup so you understand why I am doing this video and the inspirations from it and all that happy stuff. The last video I posted here on the channel, we took a look at Linux Mint 19.1. In the title it says Linux Mint 19.1 Revisited. And what I did, because I was so excited to be invited to work with the media group with the Linux Mint project, I decided I would give it a shot on my main machine. My distro of choice for quite some time now, as a matter of fact, since it has been in alpha, is Ubuntu 18.04. So that would have been late January of 2018. I've been running this long-term support version of Ubuntu. So anyway, I said, well, let's give Linux Mint a shot again and see what's changed and how it runs and all that happy stuff. And I did. And believe it or not, it worked really well. I enjoyed it and it didn't crash on me anymore after I stopped poking at the desktop and changing the settings around and it ran all my programs and it did what I needed to do and then about four or five days into it I started to get really frustrated with it and the reason why is not because there's anything wrong with Linux Mint or wrong with the cinnamon desktop it's because there's something wrong with me I have been gnomed that's what I'm calling it because I'm just now realizing that what has happened because I have used the GNOME desktop for so long, I am now completely stuck in the workflow. And when I try and use something like Cinnamon or KDE or XFCE or one of the more traditional desktops, what happens is, is that I get very frustrated because usually to do the same things that I can do in GNOME, it takes many keystrokes and mouse clicks Whereas in GNOME, it's like a straight shot. For instance, if you want to find a file or a program in GNOME, you just hit one key, and then you start typing in the name of your file. And in this case, we're looking at the feedback slide. Then I hit the Enter key. I never touched the mouse. There it is. That works for files, and it works for programs. And yes, a lot of the menus do exactly the same thing, but it really is a lot slicker here because you can do it for files and, and, and if you have more than one choice you can oh it's just awesome what you can do I'm just giving you an example like that now when I'm searching for files in Linux Mint what I found myself having to do was open up a file manager and then switch that into search mode and then search for the file and then sometimes it would crash the file manager it would take a long time to show it there was a lot of crazy stuff going on and it got very frustrating and because of the fact that I actually use this computer for everything, I mean, I make YouTube videos here, and I administer Easy Linux, and I talk to all you guys and answer your comments and run the servers and everything, not physically on this machine. I'm talking about running servers that are in the cloud. But the point is, is that this is the machine I use, so I better be really, really, really happy with it. And I've been extremely happy with Ubuntu 18.04, so I decided to roll back. So when I posted my little thing about being gnomed here on the Facebook page, a couple of people saw that and they said, one guy was not very kind, and he said, well, you're just about the most inconsistent person that there could ever be. You're constantly changing from distro to distro. Why don't you make up your mind and stick with something? And that is something I hear a lot in the comments on, on Facebook or here on YouTube, and it's kind of funny to me because people don't get it. It's like, uh, I'm doing a YouTube channel. I'm also running a project where I'm trying to help people get started with Linux. So I better play around with a lot of distributions of Linux so I can keep up with what's going on. Doesn't that sound like a really good idea if you were doing those sorts of things? It's not just a matter of me having an OCD fit and not being able to stick to a distro. I know what I like. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. And by the way, this is kind of a cute little tongue-in-cheek thing I posted here about being... Gnomed. You might want to check that out if you're a Facebook user. It is still there. So, with all of that said, I got to thinking about it, 
and I went, hey, you know what I haven't really done is shown people how to hop from one distro to the other. I mean, we're really going to show you how to do it. We're going to do it in a virtual machine today, but it applies to the real world. It applies to real hardware, and maybe you'll get something out of it. A couple of quid pro quos before we get started. I have to run the virtual machine in a window like this because if I full screen it, there is a bug in the uh, VirtualBox software that I lose keyboard input. So that's how we're going to do it. Deal with it. It's what it's going to look like. VirtualBox is uh, kind of buggy right now. Even the older versions. I've got this is version 5.2. Talked about that in past videos, but I'm going to stick with it. You know why? Because it's mostly open source. I don't really want to deal with other things. And I, yes, I've tried boxes and I've tried Zen and I've tried the others. I like VirtualBox. Deal with it. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we don't have the comments full of things about VirtualBox because who cares, right? It's plumbing, folks. Anyway, you're looking at Ubuntu running in this VirtualBox VM, and I am going to replace this with Linux Mint 19.1. So the only reason that I wanted to show you that Ubuntu was here, you have it booted up here, is just so you see that it really is Ubuntu here in this thing called Test VM. So we can go ahead and shut Ubuntu down and we can start talking a little bit about this. So the first prerequisite for what I'm going to show you today is that you do it at your own risk. If you try what I'm going to show you on your main machine and you don't know what you're doing or you get confused, then guess what? That's your fault. <laughs> I'm not assuming responsibility for it. So proceed with extreme caution. Uh, second of all, you really must have already set up the machine with a separate home partition. And if you don't even know what that is, then we have a problem from the get-go. This is slightly more advanced. But if you thought ahead when you installed your Linux distribution, and instead of just taking the standard install, which for Linux Mint and Ubuntu usually is a situation where you have one big happy ext4 partition with a swap file in it or if it's a little bit older if you're running Linux Mint 18.3 or Ubuntu 1604 then what you're going to probably have is you'll have a great big ext4 partition and then you'll have a swap partition a little bit bigger than the memory in your machine that's how it automatically sets it up if you've got that the only way to swap distros and do it cleanly is to back up all of the data that's in your home directory onto a separate hard drive and reinstall from scratch and copy it back in, which we will not cover in this video. However, I do have a tool that is designed to do that called BU. It's either backup USB or backup or whatever you want to call it that makes that really easy. It's a script and I'll put a link to the uh, scripts page on uh, the Easy Linux page. You can go take a look at it. It's got the video for that there and everything. I'll put it in there. That's a good tool that you can use to do just that. So what I have done here is I have gone to the storage settings uh, for our VM and I am going to insert a bootable USB ISO for Linux Mint. Right? This is analogous to me plugging a USB stick in or putting a DVD in the tray. We're just doing it in a virtual machine. Yeah. I have people sometimes when I do these kinds of videos that go, well, if you, if you do it in a virtual machine, it's not real hardware. I mean, it doesn't work the same. Yes, it does. A virtual machine emulates everything that a real computer does. That's the point, man. And I can show you this, and it's non-destructive, and I can use snapshots, and I can roll back, and we can talk about it, and we can break it, and it doesn't hurt anybody's machine. So that's what makes it really cool to use. So another thing we need to talk about here is that in virtual machines, we're not using UEFI. And you may have installed your Ubuntu on a machine with UEFI, and if that's the case, then you probably already know that you will have to mount your EFI partition manually to do what we're going to do. So that's pretty much all I'm going to say because if you've already set it up manually then you understand a little bit about working with UEFI 
and we're going to leave it alone. If you're going to look at your machine and you see that you have an EFI partition, then what you need to do is probably go read up on it if you don't already understand how it works to make sure that you don't uh, completely trash the machine. But I'm not going to deal with that in this video simply because virtual machines don't run with UEFI. You can turn it on for demonstration purposes, but as soon as you reboot the machine, it forgets all of the settings. So that makes life difficult. We are also running at virtual machine speeds here, ladies and gentlemen, so it may take it a while to boot up and get itself together, especially running from any kind of bootable ISO or USB stick or DVD. DVDs are real slow, but yes, there are some people out there that's how they do it. These techno nerds where everything is newer than tomorrow go, DVDs? DVDs? You actually use a DVD? What's the matter with you? Yeah, DVDs are so old school. They're archaic. Yeah, sometimes I still use DVDs, man, because I don't throw stuff away. I keep it. Got a thing about that. So anyway, we have a Linux Mint desktop, and the first thing that we need to do to make this useful is to increase the font size. And hopefully we're not having an issue with the mouse, because sometimes, no, it's working. Sometimes in a virtual machine with cinnamon, uh, you will boot it up and the mouse just won't work. But it seems to be working just fine. So we want to go to the font selector, and we're going to make it really big. So everybody can see it, man. Even on your 4K TV from across the room, <laughs> you need to make the fonts a little bigger. It's one of the big frustrations I have with a lot of YouTubers who do screencasts, God bless them, is that they'll sit there and do it, and they have the machine set with the like standard font that you would have on a high DPI screen, and you can't see anything. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do here is we need to move our data to a safe location. And this is the real trick here, is that we want to be able to reinstall Linux without having to take a lot of time copying data in and out. And we want to preserve all of the settings from the last distribution we used, plus our personal files and all that kind of thing, but we don't want it all sitting there when we install it, because if you do that, then you're going to get some weird stuff happen. Like, let's say that you're going from the GNOME desktop, like we're doing here, to Cinnamon, and you just say, well, my user is still there, and you use the same username. What's going to happen is, is that when it comes up, you're going to have some really weird setting conflicts go on, because GNOME is... It has some things in common with Cinnamon because Cinnamon is based on the GNOME desktop. Maybe some really some weirdness could happen. We want things to be nice and clean and separate when we go from one distribution to another and maybe from one desktop, uh, desktop to another. What do you say? I don't know. So let me show you how we do it. So at my computer here, what we want to do is we want to find the home directory. My computer. That's Windows. It just says computer. <laughs> All right, so now we are in the home directory, uh, which in this case is on a separate drive. So let me show you what's going on. Let's pull up Gparted here, and we'll talk about the way the partitions are laid out on this virtual machine. See, this is why this is for more advanced Linux users, this video is. Hello? Did you find it? It probably did. I couldn't tell if I typed that. Okay, there we go. Here's Gparted. Gparted is a tool that allows you to manipulate partitions, and file systems, and things like that. And what we're going to do here is, you see, here's our drive, and we have a partition up front right there. That partition is the root partition. This is where we have put our operating system. And the home directory that appears here in the root partition is actually this partition over here, which is our home partition. We have mounted the home partition into our root directory. That's what we have done. So these are actually technically separate, but linked only in the uh, boot up process when we run the file system table setup file, which is fstab. Got it? Good. You'll see what I'm talking about even if you don't know. If you're mystified and scratching your head, it'll all become pretty simple pretty soon. So on this home partition, we have our 
directory. This is our home directory right here. This is all of our personal settings. See, one of the really cool things about Linux is that all of our personal stuff ends up in this one central location. And this is what makes our experience on the computer different from somebody else's. Like if you had another account set up on the computer, you're using maybe the same software, but you have different settings for that software. You're creating different files for that software. You're running different themes, all kinds of crazy stuff. And what happens is, is that it all goes into your little home directory. So this is why manipulating Linux is so easy, because as long as you leave that data intact, then you can change out the distribution itself, not a problem. So what we're going to need to do here is do a little slicky slicky. We need to open this up in a terminal. And you notice I just right clicked there and it came up. And we're going to make this a little bigger for everybody to see. And yeah, you've got the, uh, this is the UUID of the uh, partition right there. So that's why there's that big long line of gobbledygook. That's how the system is identifying it when it mounts it up. And if we list that, you'll see that we have two directories in there. One of them is called Joe. That's our user account. And the other one is Lost and Found. Lost and Found is a system directory that is used when the system does file system checks at boot time. And if it finds anything that is kind of weird, like an orphaned file with no, it doesn't have any file name, but it's there or something, it'll stick it there. In all the years I have been using Linux, even with hard crashes and things like that, I've never found anything in Lost and Found. But that's what it's there for. And as a root user, you can go in there and look at what's in there, but most of the time it's completely empty. Uh, point being here, leave it alone, don't mess with it, we're not going to worry with it. What we want to do is we want to take and we want to move, change the name or rename, our directory called Joe to something else doesn't matter what it is as long as it is something else because what we're going to do is we're going to reuse the same username. I always use the same username every time. You could, when moving from one distro to the next, use a different username. This would have the same effect because all of the old data would go into the old username and then the new data would go into the uh, new, or you know, what you create when you install, the new data would go into the new username. I like to keep it the same because I use SSH a lot on my network and keeping the same username makes that easy to do. But in either way you do it, it works just fine, okay? So we need to do this as a root user. I forgot to put sudo in front of that because well, we might be able to get away with Let's see if it'll let us because technically that's our directory. Let's see. It, it probably won't. Though. Let's see. No, it's not going to do that. Yeah, permission denied. So we'll do that with sudo instead. I know there's little shortcuts to execute the same command as sudo, but I'm just I'm showing people things here, so we're going to do it the long way. I don't use them anyway because I never can remember what they are. I think you can put in like that or something. I have no idea what it is. Somebody will tell us in the comments because they'll have an overpowering need to share. They usually do. So now if we list the storage, you'll see that we have a directory called joe-backup, and then we have the lost and found. That's exactly what we want. So let's go ahead and close the terminal. I will type in exit. You can also do control D, or you can use the X in the upper corner, whatever works for you. I type exit. I also type clear when I clear terminals a lot of the times. I don't use the keyboard shortcuts because in certain situations, those shortcuts don't work like certain terminals and things like that. So I learned the old school way of typing all the commands in. So we have what we need here. We're good to go. So what, now what we need to do is go ahead and unmount this drive because if we don't, the installer is going to complain. There's the, where's the unmount, man? Oh, you didn't click on the right thing. Okay. There it is. Wow, it's in here somewhere. We got open with delete no oh you're clicking on the wrong thing that's why it's kind of behind the microphone <laughs> hard to see okay gang so now we're gonna go ahead and do our install and this is a standard Linux Mint install we'll, we'll roll through it just for the sake of fun 
It's taking a little while to load up the installer. There it is. Yay, installer. The Ubiquiti installer, which is used with Ubuntu and Linux Mint and a lot of other distributions. Debian and uh, Buster, the new one, Debian 10, has switched over to the Calamari installer, which is actually a really nice one. Whatever installer you're using, if you're moving from one distribution to the next, it, it should give you the same sort of uh, options. It might be worded a little bit differently, but they all pretty much do the same thing. So we have selected our language. We're going to select a keyboard. U.S. English is fine because that's kind of what we do around here. You can change that for whatever works best for wherever you are in the world or whatever language you prefer to play around in. You always want to check this box right here that it says, you know, install all the third-party stuff. Okay. Move forward. This might take a little while when you do the install, even on fast hardware, because what it's doing is it is scanning the machine at this point for Linux Mint 19.1. It's scanning the machine, looking at all the hardware, trying to figure out what to do next. And sometimes that takes a little bit of time. And it's taking a little bit of time today. So it, it might get there before Christmas. We can certainly hope so. <laughs> and it's just spinning and spinning and spinning. If you have an older Dell Core Duo, you might find that when you get to this part, when you try and install, it just spins and spins forever. What that would be an indication of is that you have, there's a little bug there with those machines that uh, Ubuntu 18.04, which Linux Mint is based on, sometimes has issues installing to those machines. It'll cause a problem where uh, you get 100% CPU usage all the time. Uh, and it has to do with the hardware detection. It's, it's, it's a bug. I don't know whether they fixed it or not. I certainly haven't seen that it's been resolved and I have been subscribed to it since I noticed it more than a year ago. Uh, so if that's the case, you may have to choose something else other than Linux Mint or uh, Ubuntu 18.04. So we're going to choose something else there. We have all kinds of options, you noticed, right? We're choosing something else. And in this installer, something else just means manual partitioning. It means you're going to figure out where stuff's going to go. So now we see kind of what we saw in Gparted. We have two partitions on the disk. So how do we go forward from here? So the first thing that we want to do is, the well, first thing you do not want to do is select new partition table. Don't do that, no. Let's choose our partitions manually. Like I said, if you have an EFI partition, you'll have to do that too. You'll have to remount that and tell it that it's okay to format it, I guess. I've never done it that way. I'm just assuming. So be careful if you're going to do that and good luck. So we are going to go from do not use this partition to choosing the EXT4 system. Yay. But we haven't mounted it anywhere. So let's, it's, it's probably going to get mad because I didn't choose a mount point. Let's we'll see what it's going to do here. No, it did it. That's okay. So we're going to go back and fix that. Let's go and change that. So if I click on that again, did I right click or, or left click to get that? Let me make sure. Okay, to change that, I got where my man, mouse took off up way up in the sky there. Let's go to change. All right. So we, we chose the XT4, which is what we wanted to do, right? So we want to mount that at root and we do want to format the partition. That's what I forgot to do. Now we want to choose our home partition. Give this just a second. It takes a while to figure this out. I don't know why. This will do this on fast hardware if you're doing this. It's not just uh, because it's in a VM. I've noticed that. Okay, so this is our home partition, right? So we want to use ext4 once again because that's the native file system. And if you're switching from something like OpenSUSE to Linux Mint or you're going to go from Ubuntu to Linux Mint, one of the issues that you might have is that especially OpenSUSE and Fedora, they use different file systems. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I know they use XFS and I think OpenSUSE uses ButterFS for the boot partition and then it creates a home partition with XFS. So you have to keep that in mind 
for your for your home partition your root partition it doesn't matter because we're going to reformat that but we are not going to reformat the home partition we're just going to mount it just like that see and then you make sure that that where it says format that that is not checked and go forward make sure that comes up and looks good now down here while that is figuring that out I want to show you that we also can figure out where the bootloader is going to go that goes on the first device that's SDA that's where it needs to be that's where it is leave that alone don't mess with it some people don't quite understand how that works and then they get a system that won't boot once they've uh, installed it and it causes all kinds of issues so just don't mess with that as long as it comes up SDA and it's on the device itself it's not on the partition so that looks really good that's the way that ought to be by the way one of the things that you can do when you're using this installer is let's say you have a system and you have a bunch of partitions on a drive uh, where you have like a backup partition or I have one for virtual machines you can actually go in and tell the thing when you're running that hey mount that at some point in the file system and when it boots up it does I'll show you that in a little while here once we get through with that I'm gonna show you uh, my FS tab for my host machine and it's pretty pretty groovy man because that's how I set it up okay so now once we have done that it's a typical install so we choose a time zone you know, Eastern you know New York's Eastern so that's good enough for me and we put our name in all right we're gonna call this uh, computer test what you do that for? I don't know. Do that again. T E S T V M. It's already chosen our username, which is Joe. Put in my super secret safe safe password here. Like so. And we will continue. And now it'll just install. It'll just keep on boogieing. And there won't be anything to do until it is done installing and we're ready to reboot and with the magic of video we are all done so let's go ahead and reboot this might take a little while we'll also see here whether the uh, system actually prompts us to remove the media in the case of a virtual machine you just hit enter because it'll automatically eject it works about half the time with VirtualBox. This might take a little while to uh, reboot as well because it is a VirtualBox machine and it is running on a machine that's also capturing high definition video. That makes things a little bit slower. Okay, we did get a prompt this time. That is cool, man. Very cool. Enter. Okay, did I lose contact with the keyboard? Is that. Nope, oh, it's going. There it goes. So now, when we reboot, we're going to reboot into our Linux Mint system that we have replaced Ubuntu with. And then what we're going to do is we will move some of the data over. So I'll show you how that works. <clears throat> been a bit under the weather for the last week or so. It's one of the reasons that it's been a while since a video has been posted. I had some lovely summer sinus thing happen to me. It put me on my butt, flat on my back. For about two or three days, man. Worst headache I ever had. But it's over now. I'm just still snuffing and snorting a little bit. I'll try not to make too many gross, nasty sounds during the video. <laughs> but I am still recovering. <clears throat> here we go. We got, we're loading a desktop. It's going to happen here, man. We're going to see if it actually worked. Yay! It worked all right. Rock and roll. By the way, somebody that I have been corresponding with was talking about the slowness of Linux Mint 19.1's boot and 19.2 is probably going to be the same because they're not going to change the base system and there's really not a whole lot you can do about it that seems to be uh, just the way it works I mean the system is relatively responsive once you get it up and running but on some hardware that you think it ought to be faster it's not quite as fast as you think it should be if that makes sense the first time that you boot into the desktop, it always takes a little bit longer because it's setting up a bunch of crap in the background. And being that this is a virtual machine, it takes some time. So here we go. We have a desktop. 
we are getting the message about software rendering mode simply because of the fact that we don't have the proper drivers installed. We don't need to have the proper drivers installed for this. I'm going to close the welcome screen. And once again, what we need to do is make things big so that people can see them better. And we'll open up the themes or the settings here. And it'll take it a little while. There it goes, getting itself together. Isn't it great when things work the way they want to? So the first thing that we need to do is make the fonts big. And we're going to make them like real big. It's 1.4. All right, and the next thing that we will do is let's play with the theme a little bit. Let's make it a dark theme just for fun. I can't stand dark themes. I don't care. I like dark themes. You can't stand them? No, well, it's just the way it is, right? It's just a video, man. Get over it. Be okay. I promise. Okay. So now... Let's assume that we have set up our <clears throat> Linux Mint install the way we need to and run all our updates and installed all the software we want. Now we want to put our data back. We want to put our personal stuff back since we've hopped to this distribution. Well, once again, we will open up a file manager. This time I'm just opening the home directory because it'll work just fine. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and full screen this. And then what we want to do in Linux Mint, Nemo file manager here, is we want to, I want to make that where everybody, can we make that bigger? Thank you, so it's not cutting stuff off. Thank you. Jeez. All right, we want to click on file system. And you'll notice that the home directory is already highlighted. Remember that the home directory is mounted separately from the rest of what you see. So all of this is on the root partition and this is just a link. Well, it's a, it's a mount. It's a little stronger than a link that goes to that other partition. So in that partition, now you see we have the Joe directory. That's the one that we created when we installed the system. And then we have Joe backup. And they're both living side by side there. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and open up Joe. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's split this using F3 because this is something that Nemo does that by the way Nautilus and Gnome does not so we can split this up so over here we are going to put the destination directory this is the current directory uh, this is our current home directory on this installation right and then over here we're gonna open up this Joe backup and the first thing that you probably want to do is bring over all the your, your regular files so you do that just by highlighting it. What I'm doing is, is clicking it with a mouse and if I hold down the control key then I can highlight more. We don't need to bring desktop over, there's nothing there. But you would want definitely things like music and pictures. If there's nothing in public, don't worry about it. If you haven't set up any templates, don't worry about it. I never use templates. We don't need examples over here. That's from the Ubuntu setup. So once you get that done, take your Take your finger off control now that you've highlighted everything that you want and just bring it over here like so. We're going to let it go. And then it's going to ask us. It's going to say, do you want to merge this stuff? And yes, we do want to merge. That's when we're merging directories here. And just keep saying yes. Like, that's it. So we've got everything over here but desktop, public, and uh, then we have... Uh, Let's see, templates and examples, and there's nothing in there, so we're not going to worry about it. Now, if you have stuff on your desktop, you might want to sync your desktop up like that, but it's not necessary. So now we can go in here and see that we have moved, let's say, I've got a bin directory here that's got a bunch of scripts in it, so that's here. That's fine. Not a problem, right? So that came over, and we're good to go. Now let's talk about settings, because not only are all of your personal files stored here, but your settings are, so where are they? Why can't I see them? Joe, please tell me. What do we do now? I'm so confused. This is what you do. You hit Control and H. This will show you all of your hidden files. See our lovely hidden files? Now keep in mind, this is the Joe Backup 
on this side and this is our destination over here don't get that confused because you really give yourself a really bad day because what you'll end up doing is is messing things up and i've done it in the past believe it or not that's why i tell you i will not accept responsibility if you screw up your computer doing this <laughs> and i hope you were smart enough to make a backup before you started too so let's see we have some files in here that we could bring over we can bring over our bash history which has all the commands that we previously typed in the last installation. I want to bring over our little face file. That's our avatar. That works pretty much on every desktop. I have noticed that every now and again, like with KDE, you'll drag that over and it won't immediately see it. And so you'll reboot it and you'll think, well, where's my little avatar? It's not there. You have to go in and find it with the thing in the desktop where you set that up. And it, you just basically go find that dot face file and reload it in there and it'll go, oh, okay. And it'll figure out that that's what it is. Anyway, so those are some any kind of things over here that you need to move over. Let's see, SSH, that's very good because that'll have your local SSH settings. And you want that. Uh, let's see, what else we got? We got Thunderbird here. That's a good thing to have. Oops, I didn't press the control key because we want to do all of this at once. Hey, man, what's going on with that? Uh, control, yeah, all right. We want to highlight everything we want. And then we wanted Bash History too. See, we got anything else? No, we don't want to mess with any of this stuff. This is per per distribution things. But we're talking about things that we can move over. Uh, you could do Bash RC if you've modified it, but if you haven't, I would leave it alone. Let the distribution deal with that. So let's go ahead and move this stuff over. So when you set up programs on your system, it's a good idea to go do a little bit of research and figure out where the configuration files are stored. They're going to be somewhere in here. So let's go to, oh, I forgot one. Let's do Mozilla because that's our, that's our Firefox. If um, That's where your Firefox profile lives, is right there. So let's go ahead and grab that one and bring it over. And, of course, this, there we go. All right, we got that done. So a lot of your settings for your programs will live in this, this thing called config. And I don't think we're going to have much of anything in here to be worried about. But, for instance, this is where Google Chrome puts all of its main configuration, and, and that's where it's stored, is in here. So you'd, you'd want to move that over. And let's see, I think LibreOffice puts its configurations in here as well. So you can just go through and look and see if you see configuration files. Uh, let's see, Rhythmbox does the same thing, so if you're using that one, you get the point here, right? So another place that you want to look is .local, and that is another place where settings and, and different things get put. So let's go back over here, and we will open up the local page here. Where it is local. Yeah, it is hiding from me. You notice it always goes in this thing called share. So it's dot local, share, and then all the configuration settings. Just the way it's set up. So what's in here that we can we can move over? Uh, one of the things that you definitely want to move over. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Hello, key rings. Uh, if you are using Google Chrome or you have passwords memorized in Chrome you have uh, accounts that you automatically log into and the same thing goes with Firefox there is a key ring in here that makes that happen so what you want to do is delete the key ring on the destination this is why you and of course I've now made it mad and crashed looks like I crashed Nemo let's see if we can get back to where we were yeah that's our home directory thank you very much so we'll split this up made it mad is what I did let's go to file system over here go to home Joe backup we'll go into where were we local go to share again let's see go over here and we need to go to ha huh, dot local and then share again and so now we're in local. So we removed the key ring and that did go away. So what we want to do is we want to bring them from over here and put them there. Anyway, like I was saying, the key rings, they have a lot of where you set things up that you just automatically log in. That's where it's taken care of. There are keys that are put in there that go along with the desktop. 
And most desktops work that way that are kind of gnome or based on GNOME. So, I, I, you know what? I don't know whether that works that way with KDE going back and forth. I've probably done it before, but it's been a long time since I did that. So now that we have all that stuff over here, you see, you kind of get the idea. We could just keep going with this. Anything that you have installed that has settings, just transfer it over there. Now you can go on and install your software. Did I already say, did you do this after you installed your software? I think I did, but really what you want to do is you want to do this as soon as you boot up the system, the new system. You want to get this transferred, then go and install your software. You don't want to, for instance, open up Firefox on the new install before you bring all that stuff that we just brought over to the, to the new install. You don't want to do that because what you're going to do is you're going to create configuration files on the new install you would have to delete them first and then bring the others over. Don't try and merge directories like with LibreOffice. For uh, LibreOffice, that's one. And also, for these are talking about the settings directories in Thunderbird. Don't ever try and merge it because it won't work. If you've already opened the program and done something with it, no. Delete the settings that are on the destination machine and the other ones, uh, you know, go ahead and move over. So... Go ahead. We don't need to see all those hidden files anymore. I just hit Control H again to toggle that off. And now our system is ready to rock and roll. So once you are completely sure that you have brought that over, you may open up your file manager yet again. And you may go to your home directory and then you can delete this. I'm not sure who owns this. Let's find out, see who the permissions are. Go to properties. Yes. Go to properties, now go to permissions. Yay! And it's owned by me. The whole directory is, so I should be able to just delete it. But make sure that you got all your stuff done before you do this. That's not going to let me do it, is it? I tried. Yeah, delete. Okay, that's fine. There's more than one way to skin a cat, boys and girls. Open in terminal. We'll just force it. Like, no, you're not going to make it so I can't do what I want to do. It's my computer, not yours. Do you understand? All right, so we look and see we have that Joe backup still there. sudo rm r for recursive. You do that with directories. And then we'll just do joe.backup. We'll make it go bye-bye. And ask for a password. I say, okay, here's a password. There you go. Post it again. And it's gone. Yay. So that's basically how you do it. You just move all of that stuff over and we'll reboot the machine. And then you go on and do your installs and stuff like that. And you are now moved over. Of course, if I hadn't said it earlier, before you attempt doing this, you want to do a backup of everything in your home directory to an external hard drive that is not connected to the machine before you do this. Because that way, there's no way that you can, if you completely, totally screw this up, you have a way back home. And we're going to talk about a couple of more tips that you can do uh, to make swapping distros and reinstalling easier. Uh, so stick around. More to come. Let's take a look at the FS tab file for the host machine I'm recording this video on. Because I wanted to kind of point out how this works when we mount different things in different places and how the system deals with it. So we're going to take a look at this and this is the one that I set up when I installed the machine and you see that the first thing that we're mounting is something at root which is our this is going to be our partition for the operating system here. That's the first line all right here yeah, this area right there okay and one of the things that Ubuntu does when it installs and creates a file system table or FS tab file is that it gives you some idea of where the stuff was at installation so you're kind of going oh, well how does that work uh, so this would be uh, SDA 1 right there and then we mount up backup which is on another drive and that goes uh, into the mounted into the system and then we have home here we have VM and then finally down at the bottom, it is mounting a swap partition. And yes, I'm using a swap partition on this machine. So if we get out of less and then I uh, show you this listing right here, ls block, 
you'll see how it's all working. So on SDA1, we have the main root partition, and then we have the swap partition. And then on SDA2, which is a great big old Western Digital Caviar spinning drive, 7200 RPM, we've got the home partition, VM, and then we've got backup as well. So you can, if you already have your partitions laid out, then all you have to do is just tell the system where to put it and whether or not you actually want it to be formatted if you want to save the data that's on those partitions. Of course, if you do want to save the data that's on the partition, then you really, really need to uh, make sure that you don't format it. <laughs> it's real important. Uh, going back here real quick, uh, one of the questions that I get asked every now and again, we talk about using a separate home partition is what if you would set up a machine that had a dual boot on it let's say you're dual booting Linux and we're gonna dual boot Linux and uh, well, Linux Mint and Ubuntu for instance would it be possible to share the same home partition technically yes because all you would have to do is when you installed the second system you would put the operating system in its own partition and then you could tell it to mount to home if you were using exactly the same username, then what would technically happen is, is that it, no matter what system you were logged into, you would see the same files. So if you were running Ubuntu and you messed around and created a bunch of files, the moment that you moved, booted into Linux Mint, you'd see them. And if you deleted, the same deal, right? Hope you follow what I'm saying. The only problem is, is that when you're running different desktops, or even the same desktop on two different Linux distributions, you're going to run into a situation where you get all kinds of funky conflicts because what you set for one distribution may not work for the other. And you might boot it up and you get some very strange things happen because what what tends to happen is, is that Linux distributions tend to have different versions of the same software. And as software develops, the developers change how the configurations work. So you might end up with a situation where you have an older piece of software trying to access configuration files from a newer version of that same software, and it goes, I don't know what to do with it. You can do that if you would do so. You, another way to do that is to make your data directories, and we're talking about your music and your documents and everything, in one of the distributions to be all symlinks. So in other words, you would still install the distribution in its own little partition and you wouldn't tell it to mount a different home directory you'd say it's all right here and then what you would do is, is go in and you would actually delete the directories that were set up for things like music and uh, the uh, videos and, and whatever files you want to keep documents and, and so forth pictures and you would turn those into sim links which would go over to the other home directory for the original Linux distribution. You can do it that way and then you get the result that you're looking for. It's just that your personal settings may be different. So it gets really complicated like with your email for instance if you use an email client you see how that can get crazy. So uh, I just don't even bother with stuff like that. I know people want to do it and play around with it but I, I don't like dual boots of any kind. I I just don't support them because they, they get confusing. Even if you're dual booting Linux <laughs> It just it's crazy yo just make life simple one operating system per machine that's that's my deal so anyhow let's go ahead and get out of this terminal I got one more thing I want to talk about so when I am doing all of this checking things out installing things swapping hard drives around playing with different configurations and all that kind of thing when I have to go back home to Ubuntu 1804 one of the things that I have done is I have written an install script and I've talked about this in past videos we've been through this and what this is is just in instead of me having to manually and find all this software and install it I can pretty much restore my system immediately if I want to what I can do is, is uh, I just do a base install of Ubuntu and then I go ahead and update it and I get it all perfect and this is before I you know then I move the data over haven't installed any software yet and then once I move all the data over I get access to this script because it's in my data set and I run it and what this does is it will go through and automatically install all of the stuff that I need to have Ubuntu set up so I just turn this loose and, and let it do its thing 
And I've gone through this before in past videos, but for those of you who haven't seen it, I will, I'll kind of walk through it one more time here. So the first thing that happens up here at line 7 is that we have to have a program called GDB to make this work. Now GDB is the point and click uh, deb package installer that comes default with Linux Mint. So when you click on a deb package that you download, Google Chrome or something like that, that's what opens up. Well it also runs from a command line and I, I prefer to use this at a command line because it will pull in all of the dependencies automatically and it sets everything up the way it should. You can use like dpkg but it's actually two commands to do that. It's like dpkg install and somebody else turned me on to another one where you can use apt and I, I think that's kind of a new thing. I don't know about that where you can do apt install and then give it the name of the dev package. Just point where it is. I've not tried that, but I, I tend to rely on good old GW at the command line. That's just the way I do it. But the first thing we need to do is make sure that GW is installed, and if it is a fresh install of Ubuntu, it won't be there. So that's what this line does. What it does is, is it goes and lists all the packages, and it looks to see if GW is there. And if GW isn't there, uh, if in other words, this generates an error. In other words, grep can't find it, which is the command right there. That's what the two pipes back to back tell the system if you get an error message then run this command then it'll go ahead and install GW. so that's taken care of right up front then we install a whole buttload of software and this is ever evolving what I want installed on my machine so every time I change something I, I jump in here and edit this to make sure it's got the software that I want and then it goes to see if it can find the local packages that I keep on my machine I keep them in a directory called uh, downloads packages I can change my username if I want to because guess what I don't I use a right here I'm using the shell variable for username so those you guys that are into that that's that's what that does this grabs the stuff from my home directory and it starts installing those packages and it does it in a loop until it's done that's what this is here for if it can't find that then it's gonna tell me hey dummy you didn't transfer your data over yet we can't do this and it's just gonna wait five seconds and then keep keep going with the script but it's gonna put it up on the screen the error message long enough for me to see it let's see what else are we doing here uh, we installed VirtualBox from the repositories so what that does it means I have to put myself in a group called VBox users so I have a command here that does that that's this little section right there we want to get rid of some undesirable packages like the Fluendo MP3 package which is a piece of garbage that's in, still in Ubuntu 18.04 it should be removed and then we have uh, the Deja Dupe which is the Ubuntu standard backup program and Shotwell. I don't use Shotwell, I use Gthumb for managing photos. So I get rid of those. Some people see this and go, why are there two Y's? Why do you have that? You don't need that. You just need one. Yes, you do. You need two Y's because what that does is it instructs the apt package, the, uh, the program that actually installs and removes stuff that I don't care if you get an error or not. I don't care if it screws up. Just do it. Just make it go away. So that's why you'll see why why. Why do we have this down here? Well, these are snap packages that ship with Ubuntu 18.04 and they don't integrate well with the desktop. So I go ahead and remove the snap packages. You know, Ubuntu's all into snaps lately. So I go ahead and remove those snap packages and then I install them from the regular repositories in Ubuntu. And once again, we have the why why, which means just do it. Don't bother. Don't mess with me. Then I have a script that goes out to Google and it downloads Google Chrome. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to purge Firefox. So we're going to re remove Firefox and we're going to remove the other package which is firefox local en and that goes away, okay? And it checks to see if there's a directory for Mozilla in here. And if it does, it gets rid of it because I want Firefox to be gone, man. And there's another directory like that. It makes sure that there's uh, the cache for Firefox is make that go away too. That's in case I've opened up Firefox. Now we create a place for the system to work. Make a directory called uh, temp slash gc install dot temp which is for Google Chrome and then the wget command goes out to the internet downloads the Google Chrome from uh, uh, the uh, Google repository brings that down the next thing it does is it uh, installs it with GW and then removes the temp package and moves on I have another third-party piece of software called Ocean Audio that I use I have the same sort of setup there 
So it goes out and grabs that from the Ocean Audio server and brings it down and puts it in there. And then uh, let's see, what else are we doing here? Uh, we are adding the repository for TimeShift, which is uh, the snapshot program that I use for snapshotting the operating system so I can roll things back. This is installed by default in Linux Mint, by the way. But for Ubuntu 18.04, you still need to hook up the PPA, and that's what that does. So it, it hooks that up, and then it goes out, and it grabs time shift. And for you old timers who are wondering about this little command set right here, and you're seeing that it doesn't automatically, uh, or I haven't set it up to update. Remember, it used to be that you'd add a PPA, and the next thing you'd have to run is sudo apt update. You don't have to do that anymore. Uh, since Ubuntu 18.04, it's hip enough to know, oh, you added a PPA. Well, let me update that for you. So it goes ahead and it does it. And then this is for Qt integration on Ubuntu 18.04. Uh, basically, it tells it that we're going to use, uh, basically, GTK2 themes will be mirrored for uh, Qt applications. So we put this line in the Etsy environment file right there. This is a bug fix for Ubuntu 18.04 that uh, makes it hard for the system to actually write optical disks. And yes, I actually do occasionally write optical disks, especially compact disks, when I create little mixes for friends and stuff like that and uh, different things. I have to make a CD every now and again, so that is why that is in there. That's the bug fixed. And then finally, we have all done because you're done and then you reboot the system and that's it so that's that's how that works now if anybody would like a copy of this file uh, I can't really post it on YouTube anywhere so what you need to do is go to easylinux.com go to the contact page and if you ask me for it directly I'll be very happy to give it to you I'll send it to you as an attachment to an email uh, through that and uh, that's how it works. Just go and fill out the little form and say, hey, I want a copy, and then be looking in your email for an email from me that will have that attached to it. Uh, so that leaves that entirely up to you if you want to do that. And um, if you do, by the way, go to Easy Linux, totally off the subject, and you use the contact page, be sure to check your spam folder for a reply, because every now and again, when I send you uh, an email back from the email address that that works from. I'm not going to say it out loud. I'm trying to keep it a little bit under wraps. I don't want to broadcast it, uh, but I will send you an email from that address and it might end up in your spam folder. So if you want a copy of this, I'll give it to you. But this is customized totally for me. So if you just want to take it and play with it and you know see what you can do with it, then that's perfectly fine. I'll send it to you. A version of this is also up on the uh, Easy Talk forum. So if you want to see it there, you can as well. You have to go through and look at old posts. I think it's in the community comments, commons section that I posted that. been quite some time ago, though. So there you go. Wow, I made it. I got that video done. I can't believe it. That video has been sitting in a can about half done, or prepared for at least, for a week or two because I've been so sick. So it's actually done. And I think I actually covered all the stuff that I wanted to talk about, which probably means that I forgot something or I got something wrong, because that's how that usually works. Once again, I want to say thank you very much for your kind attention, and I want to thank everybody who has been liking the videos and subscribing the ch to the channel. It's unbelievable how quickly all this stuff is growing, and a little, little jab to other YouTubers. Maybe if you guys would stop and show people how to do things every now and again, You'd have such a wonderful, loyal audience like I have developed on my channel. I, I noticed that a lot of other YouTube people that talk about Linux, they don't ever show you how to do anything. You ever notice that? They want to sit around and talk about what Linux distribution Superman might use. Uh, okay, that's mildly entertaining, but I want to know how to do things. So that's what I try and do is show you how to do stuff, even if it's wrong. You know? Your feedback is always welcome. Uh, you can check down in the description of the video. I've got a bunch of links. I've got an extra one to the Bash Script page because I have talked about BU earlier in the video, but you can also go to easylinuxstint.com. Uh, you can go to the contact page there and talk to me. Uh, we have a Facebook page. The Facebook page is uh, pretty cool if you are a Facebook user. That is kind of where a lot of people are discovering the Easy Linux project on Facebook, so that's cool. So if you are a Facebook user, give it a like and participate in what's going on there. 
And then we also have the Easy Talk Forum. One of the things I had to do on Facebook recently was disable private messages on the Facebook page. I'm sorry, gang, but that got out of hand and got very hard to keep under control. If you want to talk to me, then contact me through Easy Linux. Use the contact page. If you want to talk to me and a bunch of other people and you want to be a part of the community, then go to Easy Talk. And that is uh, our very own forum. We host it ourselves, and it is very safe and secure, and it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of great moderators there that make sure that people are nice to one another. So it's a fun, safe environment to be in. You can check that out as well. And as always, thank you for your subscriptions. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your likes. The more you do, the better it is for me, the Easy Linux Project, and this here YouTube channel. So we will wind it up with that. Thank you so much for watching. We'll do it again soon.